Are you a writer with a great screenplay just sitting on your desktop? Are you looking for written analysis of your work by experienced creatives? Are you trying to get industry professionals to read your work, but you don't know how to reach them? Then enter the Blue Cat Screenplay Competition. Created by veteran screenwriter Gordon Hoffman, the Blue Cat Screenplay Competition has helped unknown writers launch their professional careers for over 25 years. This year, the Blue Cat Screenwriting Competition will award $18,500 in cash, and everyone who enters will receive written analysis on their work and getting feedback on your screenplay is worth like a lot. The deadline to enter is October 30th, but if you miss it, you could still catch their late deadline on December 11th. Check them out on the social medias at Blue Cat Writers on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So stop waiting to be discovered and send your feature screenplay, TV pilot, and short film script to Blue Cat today. And the deadline to enter is October 30th, but if you miss it, you can still catch their late deadline on December 11th. And you can use our code, all caps, B-C-H-A-R-D-23 for $10 off. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome. This is the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Mark Bissell, the founding host of the podcast, and I'm a sci-fi horror filmmaker. And my first feature film, The Alternate, is out right now on digital and DVD. I'm Liz Manischel. I'm a writer, director, producer who has made two features and is currently in development on 7,652 more. I'm a distribution consultant who does sales, and I used to manage Sundance Institute's creative distribution initiative. This week, we welcome marketing expert and co-founder of Smart House Creative, Ryan Davis, on the show to talk about indie film marketing, how she approaches a campaign, and about the power of Facebook ads. And then after that, we play yet another round of The Game. But first, Liz, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm so good. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm doing all right. We got my son got sick this weekend. So I am a little behind today. And he is in the other room watching uh, some like weird YouTube channel that's on HBO. It's like a YouTube show of two kids in Russia and HBO Max is broadcasting it. Like it's just very confusing. What's new? I talked last time about uh, being really itchy to figure out what my project is. And I feel pretty confident that it's going to be this horror feature I've been talking about on the podcast called Best Friends Forever. It used to be called Friendship is Hell. We got some feedback on the script from Andrew Schrader and Aaron Nemoyton. Ooh. Yeah. And the feedback is not, please rewrite the whole thing or gosh, I hate it. You know, the feedback is here are some cosmetic issues. Here are some questions I have. The feedback made me think like, oh, we have a f- maybe one more revision and then we could start to go out with it. So I'm building a deck. I'm trying to figure out what actors I want. Uh, I'm trying to decide. I think I'm going to pay someone to do a budget and breakdown of it so I can figure out how much money I need to raise. And I am planning to make this movie in 2023. That is what's going on in my life right now. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So what's your first step to doing that? Well, it's, it's, it's finding someone like usually I'd have a first AD slash producer on board the project and they would mm. do a budget breakdown as like a like an exercise for themselves to get to know the film. And we'd be using that budget to figure out how much to fundraise. But I don't have anyone right now. I have one producer, Pardis, who doesn't do budgets. And so I have to do what everyone else does. <laughs> I have to pay someone to do the work. I have to yeah. find someone who's not going to charge me $7,500. I heard like, I know some people will charge like 1500 and that's on the low end. But I know at least one person who would do it for 500 So I'm trying to figure out who's Mm. willing to do this for me. Yeah, I'm actually doing that right now with the movie. For yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing that you do it for yourself. Yeah. I I have a software that I start using called Studio Binder because I I needed to go further than just just coming up with the numbers and budging it because it's like, oh, well, we really need to know, like, what are these actors actual days going to be? With the budget and the breakdown, the breakdown of the script. Yeah. Yeah. So like this, this schedule that I'm doing right now is really helpful on figuring that out. And I mean, obviously, a real AD is going to come in and they're going to redo the schedule at some point, but this will give a rough idea of like exi- the, the number of days that we should, you know, book the talent for. And yeah. having AD to movie before um, an indie feature, I kind of have a good enough sense that like, yes, we can actually make these days and, you know, like it's reasonable. I can't do that. And also, I don't want to do that <laughs> because the goal <laughs> is like not how many days can you fit it into, right? Because I'm trying to do this in a way where it's like, 
can I fit it into my lifestyle? Is there a way where we can make this movie where it's not oh. 18 days all in a row, but we could do weekends where we could do half days, things like that. Yeah. So it's the goal. It's like, can what's the fast cash version rather than the fast food version of not that what you're doing mm. is fast food, but what you're doing is trying to save your production money. Right. So I'm trying to right. figure out what is I what's the ideal circumstance in terms of having that time with the actor, not what's the lowest budget quite yet. I'm not at the stage where I have to figure out the lowest budget quite yet. I will be soon. Well, it's a completely different way of, you know, scheduling and budgeting a movie. Yeah. It's also totally worthwhile. But I feel like if you if you do it on the weekends, for instance, right, like then you're going to kind of like the, the lighting and the camera rentals and all that stuff like potentially could go up because like you usually save oh, yeah. a bunch of money from getting it all at once. And that's part of the reason why you like got to do it in like three weeks or whatever, you know, or two weeks oh, or yeah. God forbid, 10 days. <laughs> well, I have some friends that rent out their own gear and are kind oh, of nice. like mini little production houses. And mm. my plan is to try to figure out that kind of situation, right? It's like yeah. not necessarily work with a traditional rental house, but work with individual vendors and obviously have an insurance policy, but to work a little bit atypically so that they feel rewarded in some way for helping us yeah. out. So I'm trying to figure that out. Yeah, totally. You got to find the right person with the right like you know mentality and interest because like yeah. my gaffer who i i love also owns his own rental house but he hates the idea of stretching it out he just wants to get it all done totally be done with it move on to the next project so he can make more money with his gear on like a commercial or whatever like oh, the yeah. idea of like trying to do it in like piecemeal across a time would like give him a heart attack but then there's other people who are like totally down like oh yeah i have a free weekend oh the gear's just sitting there let's bring it out you know so like it's just completely different personalities you know but if you find the right people that's like a totally ideal scenario right know? and like the script is actually all it's a lot of it's outdoors and a lot of it is in like a place where like big bear or like arrowhead or something like that oh, would wow. really be appropriate so if I can find an interested party who has a vacation rental house in Big Bear mm. or like Arrowhead, mm. that's again, that's ideal. So I'm going to I'm keep on thinking about Talia Lagasse and the way she made This Is Not A War mm. Story. And I'm thinking about really bringing in the people with the most valuable assets, right? The equipment and the locations and bringing them in early to see if we could work together and again, reward them and compensate them appropriately, but have them be partners rather than just kind of like faceless vendors. Yeah, that's really smart. That's a really smart approach. Right. I wish you luck, Liz. Thank you. What are you doing? Well, I, I am doing that schedule. Yeah. I worked on it last week a bunch. And then this week, I, I mean, it's just started. But, you know, already I'm so busy with work. It's like really hard to carve out some time to, you know, chip away at it. We're doing casting meetings. We're waiting to hear back from people. So we're kind of like in that stage still. And I mean, I don't know how long we're going to be in it. But, you know, basically, I'm hoping that we get some some updates this week. Our, our EP was on vacation for a week and a half or something. So we haven't really been touching base lately, but we've got a meeting this week and, you know, hope it goes well. And yeah, hope we push it forward. The script is now like so bulletproof. Like we've, we've gone over and over and over. And there's a couple areas where the writer and I disagree, but they're so small. It's like, we can just deal with those issues later. You know, it's mostly just like dialogue and lines <laughs> like here and there, like all those big story parts are done. Everything like the, the script, the scene order we, we like. And cause it was all kind of, it was like, it's like a, it's a multiple stories, right? Like it's a bunch of stories all kind of converging. So like the way that we had the stories cut up was one way, you know, in earlier drafts and we kind of worked together to like, you know, decide to keep, oh, this, this whole sequence should be in one chunk together because that just makes more sense for that sequence. And then we can have these ones interspersed here. And so all that stuff, I think we're all really happy with now. It's just, mm. you know, the, the tiny little line details, but that's going to change when we do casting anyways. So huh. we'll see kind of in the waiting game with that. Yeah. You know, the waiting game. Uh, yeah, yeah. Playing yeah. it forever. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what, what happens, right? Like the, it goes in phases. Like you finish one project, you're like, need a little bit of a break. Then the creative bug starts biting you. And then it's like, whether you have the patience for the long haul or not. And I, I don't think I have the patience. 
patience for the long haul. I just don't think I have. What do you mean? Like, like you don't want to wait for a project to be ready? Because like, you just do another project while the other one's yeah. in, the wait, in the waiting mode. You know? But you have to kind of make a decision. Like when I'm working on projects, I have like, I have a to do. Okay. So I look at my to do list every single day and it lists every single project I have am attached to as long as, as well as my, you know, jobby job stuff and podcast stuff and things like that. Right. And I think I realized that that's harmful and I need to just like delete <laughs> delete the to-do lists of the projects that have their own machinations that aren't just me, right? And just be yeah. a partner, deliver, you know, if someone asks something of me, I deliver it to them. But to only focus on the project that's going to go next year as like the main to-do list item. That's how I see it. It sounds very unpoetic. Yeah. So it's just, it's about energy and focus and what's in front of you. And so I just don't have the attention. I don't have the bandwidth to do a little thing on every single project anymore. I think I only have the bandwidth right. to actively strategize about one project, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Which is what you're doing too, right? You have other projects. Sounds like you're constantly yeah. figuring out other projects. I have this script that I've been... So it's so funny. Like I was writing one script like a, a year ago and I was really excited about it. And then like ha halfway through it, I think I got to like 40 pages or something. I was like, nah, I don't want to write this anymore. I've got this other idea I want to write. So I started like <laughs> outlining that one and I wrote like a page of that and then I still love that idea but now I'm just like okay so I have like almost half a script here I have a great idea for a script and an outline and some words here it's like dude just finish one of them just so you can have it done and like who cares if it's gonna be your next movie or not or whatever you never know but just finish it so now I'm thinking like I should just go back to the other one that's completely outlined from beginning to end and I have 40 pages written of it and just mm -hmm. finish a fucking draft of it and then be done with it for now and then move on to whatever else but like sitting with half parts of things it just doesn't feel very good and it's not useful yeah but you don't want to force it there's a reason why you lost interest in it uh maybe i do want to force it just <laughs> push it out and it's not because i didn't like the idea it's just because i didn't think that i can make it but it's like oh well but you never know where you're going to be in a year from now or two years from now or four years from now and maybe that's going to be the perfect thing that you can make later on so like just yeah. get it done have it in your back pocket and then don't stress if it's going to be your next pro i can't think i i always get upset uh, obsessed about this idea of like well whatever i want to work on i want it to be the thing that's going to be my next thing like i want that to get the most attention right. but what i'm learning is like you have no idea what your next thing you is going to be like it could be anything so just work on the thing that is like closest to being done get that off the list then move to the next one closest to being done off the list next you know i think that's what i want to do but i had not been writing i don't know when i'm going to start writing again it's i basically have to finish the schedule first so the schedule is first and then i think then i'm pretty much done with all my my responsibilities for this current project and then i can move on to writing this other thing there's so much minutia every single project it's like you think it's just one thing and then it's like there's 45 more one last things right it's yeah. always like around the corner i'm gonna be done with this or i just have to do this one i mean i know exactly what you're saying and i encourage you to finish whatever project you want to finish but also you could go back to that script in two years and have a whole new take that breathes new life into yeah. it that will finish it off and, and and be more exciting and more fun to do yeah totally yeah i don't know i feel like also i've just been really overworked at my job lately and i'm also doing like some freelance things too and it's just like i feel like i'm being like i'm just exhausted at the end of the day and like i don't even really get time to like just relax like i'm always yeah. i always have my computer out and like i rarely put it down to like watch a movie or just to like read a book or just to lay you know and not do anything like so i feel like i need to you know recognize that that's really important and you know maybe if i finish my work and i have two more hours in the evening like don't try to work on the schedule just like close yes. the laptop and give yes. myself some some me time damn it because i need that too well i'm on <laughs> oh. board for that i think i've said that to you before in the past that oh you yeah need to all take the time. a little break you you tend to overwork yeah. yourself <laughs> i've noticed I that know. i thought I that i, I overworked help. myself but i do not compared to you i can't help it man it's like really nuts i don't know i needed it need to chill but yeah, I mean, there's lots of exciting things happening and, you know, it's still fun to have the movie be out. I, I, I get like little messages from people every now and then. Debbie Bright Bradshaw, who had a short oh, film in our yeah. Get Shorty hot segment. Cake. She, yeah. Oh man, I love that Hot short. cake. We love hot cake. <laughs> so good. So good. 
And she wrote me like this really long, really nice message about how much she liked the movie and how professional she thought it was. And, you know, it was just a really sweet message. So thank you, Debbie, for that. And, you know, I've gotten lots of other really nice messages from other friends and filmmaker friends. And yeah, just it's really cool to get those every once in a while. And I'm just not like, I, I'm not working on it enough. I, I should be like, I should have an, a Facebook ad going right now. I've been trying to set it up like all week, basically. And I just don't have the time. And like, at least now I kind of have an idea of what I want it to be, what this Facebook ad would look like. And so I, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to do it soon, but it just, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not pushing it. And then, and then I was on, <laughs> on Alex Ferrari's podcast last, last Friday, which will be coming out. It should be out by now. The time that you listen to this, it'll have come out the week prior. And he was talking about some guy who like made $7 million on his indie feature by like running all these Facebook ads and doing all this stuff. And I was like, Oh my God, like I'm terrible. I should be running Facebook ads. Like I, I want to make $70 million. I don't think I, that's, that's in the cards for me. I like, think I can really make $7 million with my movie. Like this guy did, but at least I should be doing something, you know, so. Wait, you're going back and forth a little bit now, though. Like you just said, I'm going to take a break. And then the immediate next sentence was, here are five more, th- 5,000 more things that I need to <laughs> yeah, do. I know. I still have to do it, though. It's like I got to sneak it in and, and then also have my break time. <laughs> But yeah, when is that going to happen? I don't know. Last thing I wanted to say was we got a really nice message from Kyle Kenyon, Kyle freaking Kenyon, for all of you out there who remember him being mentioned on the show. Dad pals. Dad pals. We love dad pals. It's so amazing. Couldn't believe it only had 200 views on Vimeo for this thing that is so funny. Yeah. Oh my God. But he's making his first feature with his with his partner, his life partner and his filmmaking partner. I think it's called Ruthie Joins a Death Cult, which is like an amazing title. I supported it on Seed and Spark. They're doing a crowdfunding campaign right now. So I really encourage everyone to check it out. Um, it's a very, very cool little short. They, they basically followed the same method that I did for the alternate. They have a short film version of it, like a little teaser. And then they have their video explaining the project that has like clips from the teaser in it. And they have really wonderful, well thought out perks. And they used lots of Futurama GIFs, which like, basically, if I see like a Futurama <laughs> GIF like motif going on in something, it's like, you pretty much have my money. Like, you know, you'll get the $5 or the $1 at least because I just am such a huge Futurama fan. But yeah, so check that out. That was really cool to see. But what is also really cool to check out is our uh, our Patreon page. Go to www.patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. There you can see behind the scenes making of the show. We have our weekly meetings that we do with our producer, Eric, who is very hilarious. And it makes me laugh to an insane extent sometimes on these meetings, which is really fun. There's also bonus videos from me and Liz uh, talking about various struggles that we're encountering in our daily filmmaking lives. I think I've got like three videos or four videos. Liz has one. I think I have one question mark. Yeah, I'll take one. I'll take one. And then there will be bonus episodes. I do have a bonus episode sitting out. Speaking of things to do, I've got a bonus episode on my computer that I just have to load. <laughs> so eventually that will be loaded. I can't promise when. Liz told me to stop promising. Don't I'll promise. Do just do it when you do it. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to try to take that into my, my life. But yeah, any any support you give on there would be great. Really, really means a lot to us. You can also check out the International Screeners Association, the ISA, who are just a wonderful partner to us. The ISA is a, a place designed to connect writers with filmmakers through a number of programs they offer, including consultation courses, contests, and their top 25 writers list, featuring some of their best writers. A friend of mine, Johnny Gilligan, was on that list. He uh, is in the alternate, and he's got like a couple of amazing scripts that I'm like trying to get made. You know, they're so good. He's such a great writer. It's it's incredible. It's like his first two scripts he's like sending out for like these amazing sci-fi scripts. So anyways, he's part of the ISA. So you know, they got good writers. So go check them out today. www.networkisa.org. You can sign up for free. Check out what they got. But without any more further delay, here's our chat with Ryan Davis. We are on the line with Ryan Davis of Smart House Creative. Ryan, can you give us like a bio on how you got to where you are and and why you have passion for digital marketing? Sure. Yeah. My passion for digital marketing comes from my passion for film. I actually started working in public television very briefly. And then I worked for a distribution company that was based here in Seattle. And if distribution big companies still existed in Seattle, I would work for them. I just really loved the film business and the exhibition side of things. And I moved away from sort of being on set and production. I just saw that that wasn't my niche. And I was really excited to promote other people's projects and sort of get on their train and 
be inspired by their vision. And so that was, I started moving in more in the direction of exhibition and distribution. And then I met Brad Wilkie. His specialty was digital marketing. And by that point, I had been the marketing director at Northwest Film Forum in Seattle. So it's been a lot of time promoting films in the exhibition space. And that was a lot more of media outreach and grassroots outreach and partnerships and stuff like that. And so partnering with Brad, we sort of became more than the sum of our parts and were able to form the company we wished existed that we would have applied to work for if it already existed, which is this company that would specialize in marketing artistic projects, but specifically independent films and helping artists get their projects out there and build their audience. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I had another question for you, but I'm seeing on our list here, this difference between what's the difference between PR and publicity? Like, I didn't know there was a difference. Is there a difference? What is the difference between those two? It's sort of like when people say like, what's an EPK? You know, it's just one of those things that... For my purposes, like the term, it doesn't really matter anymore, you know? So, of course, like public relations is would be more in like this corporate setting of like how you're being perceived if you had like a corporate crisis or reputation management. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, media relations would be like specifically with the media. So for us, we do sort of do more media relations than PR or public relations just because we're not working for Marvel. We're not on the scale. We're kind of like what might be included. The Ray Donovan public relations side of things just isn't necessary and called for at, at, at the scale that we're at. So yeah, so I would say mostly what you're talking about when people say they need PRs, they need that media relations, and they're not necessarily, you know, looking to combat negative reactions towards their film because their actress was caught in a compromising scenario or something like right. that. That just usually doesn't come up. Yeah. I think this is the most hardball question I'm going to ask, which is, let's say a film team comes to you and they have an indie drama with no cast. And I'm sure you're asked this on a daily basis. How do you help f help them find an audience and grow an audience? Yeah. So there's a variety of tactics. And of course, we say this all the time. And I, I feel like people think it's a little bit of a dodge, but every film is different, truly. So there's definitely cases where there's honestly no cast or not no cast, but no stars, you know, no A-list names. But there might be something else with that film that makes it stand out that, you know, it was filmed someplace unusual or, you know, it has a story of overcoming obstacles. And that would be one thing we'd focus on. So we'd look for more feature stories about what makes this project special. And we might write listicles or submit articles to places like IndieWire or Movie Maker about the filmmaking process itself and, you know, how they manage to do that. So we try to find something that's that's really interesting about it. What would make it definitely easier is if the film then went on to get into some festivals and start to get a little bit of a claim on its own. It is frustrating when you've made a very excellent indie drama with no name actors yet and you aren't getting success on on the festival circuit because that does sort of, you know, make things a lot challenging. But, you know, we've worked with all sorts of projects and it's it's just a matter of finding what does stand out about your project to give it that angle. And if you're a filmmaker willing to talk about the process, that's really helpful because people enjoy that. They like seeing the behind the scenes. And that's something where social media and digital marketing has opened that up for a direct line to your potential new fans. So some of those things and then some of the other side of this might be, and actually this is something I've heard Liz talk about before too, which is success versus the appearance of success. And so if you, you know, your, your film's not doing great, we can still work with you on how to make it seem like it's just killing it. <laughs> And that, you know, can seem like a little bit of a dodge. And, but I think it's super helpful. And to just sort of understand expectations that you've, you know, maybe made a first feature film, it's not going to necessarily be clerks that breaks you out into this, you know, amazing new indie star, but it's a solid work. And if you can get some great, a couple reviews with a good poll quote or, you know, that article that you write for filmmaker, and then you can say, I was featured in filmmaker. Like these are things that then it's up to you to kind of present your as this idea of success. And a lot of people might not understand how the film festival world works. So if you've gotten into some modest festivals that are quality festivals, but you know, not Sundance, not these top tier, those can still not only appear like success, but it can actually bring some great connections. Like if you go to these festivals yourself and meet some new people, it's not all is not lost by not getting into the, the first tier of film festivals. So you can go to them, you can make it look like you have this amazing adventure on your Instagram, but you can also actually make real connections. And then 
move on to your next one. Let it go. It's okay. Move to your next one and, and just how to manage those expectations. So if, when a movie comes across your desk and you're going to start working on it to get press and, you know, get like working up to its release, like, you know, it's already got distribution and all those things. What are like some of the first steps that you do and, and how do you like to collaborate with filmmakers at that stage? Yeah. So this you're saying a film is done with the festival circuit, is about to be released on demand somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So definitely the, you know, we would watch the film, get a sense of what <laughs> what we're looking at, what the, all those different angles that we talked about. And then if they do have distribution, see what that distributor is offering them, which a lot of times is because they're talking to us. It's because it's not all that much, which is okay. You can still have a good experience with your distributor and it, it just not includes, you know, a marketing budget or, or a lot of support there. But, you know, having a distributor kind of separates you, puts a little bit more prestige onto the release and, you know, makes it taken a little bit more seriously in, in critical circles. So it's always can be helpful to have a distributor, not always necessary. So we would take a look if it did have some stars, we'd talk about what kind of access they're willing to grant, if they're available to do any press, if the filmmakers even available or interested or, or who on the team would be the spokesperson if there was interest there. If we're looking at some kind of genre film that opens a lot of doors into, you know, some kind of clever marketing campaign, you know, if they're like different character first looks or, you know, there's just different ways to approach a project that if it if it has a little bit more of a playful edge to it, you can have some fun that way. You, We could, at the very beginning, look into a possibility of some kind of industry announcement. So announcing that the distribution has been arranged is, is possible, depending upon what the, the deal looks like. So kind of think about those very early, if we're early enough on board, if there's time to arrange an exclusive trailer placement, that could be something that we would look at. So it depends on the kind of timeline that we have. So then the next thing would be, you know, we'd take a look at the film and also sort of think through some of the comparable films and see how they've performed before and who covered them, what critics reviewed them positively. So uh, and if the filmmaker has earlier work, we'll think about who's covered their earlier films and who might be interested in, in this one as well. We do usually put together some kind of press release for every film because you never know if you can get some coverage from a press release. That's, you know, feels like it's coming to you at that point. You might as well try, although press releases are not what they used to be. And I still get some drafts of press releases that say for immediate release, as if there's any any possibility that someone might leak this early. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, we still do a press release. And then that is a great way to get everyone on the same page. It also, you know, we'll think through, are we considering this film in the same way? Are the angles that we're putting forth make sense to the rest of the team? Do they like the key still that we chose? So even if the press release itself does not become this hugely important piece of currency, it's a good exercise to make sure that you have everything you need. You talk through who's going to field any replies, things like that, to just make it a smooth process. And then we start researching and start thinking through who would want to cover the film, start building some personas of the possible audiences and for the digital marketing campaign. If they have key arts, start building out some of what the graphics might look like on social media. If they don't have key art, well, that would happen earlier that we'd want to make sure they had something that we could work with. And then we'd start to put together a bank of different content that we can work with. So whether that's different clips, graphics, I mentioned those characters, stills, whatever might make sense for that film. If it's a social issue documentary, think about other news clips or other coverage, you know, different ways you could tie in that to get people engaged. Just so you're going into it, you, you don't have have to think every day, what am I going to post today that we've we've done a lot of that work in advance. And then we start planning out some kind of campaign. You said something that was so intriguing. You develop personas of potential audience members. How deep do you go into building this persona? Like, do you know where they grocery shop? Like what? <laughs> how substantial is this potential character? We generally don't. For us, the personas are not necessarily, you know, like the that level of, you know, where they were grocery shop. But because that that's not a lot of action items based on that, the, you know, you can't target an ad based on how someone grocery shops is just you. At, <laughs> not yet, at least we don't know that stuff. soon. <laughs> yes, so we we generally think of it as tied to how we could possibly target those ads is the most useful thing to us. So gender, age, location, you know, lookalike audiences of other pages they might follow or other films that they're interested in. If it is a documentary, then the affinity interests that have to do with you know whatever that documentary subject is about. So we'll put together a few sets of, you know, usually about three 
notes and think through it that way. There's not a lot of payoff for us going too deep on that because it's especially, you know, in terms of media outreach, we're going to try to turn over as many stones as we can. So it, it's not like we would not reach out to some place for a review because that writer doesn't shop at the same store. You know, we, we want to reach out to everybody for a possible review. So that level of detail, we just don't see an actionable change in our approach based on that. So when you reach out to get reviews, do you do like kind of a like a spray and pray kind of approach where you like you send like a screener link to Variety to like all the vendors that you can think of? Or do you target specific writers and like try to go kind of more of a granular approach to get reviews written for the movie? Yeah, good question. So we do usually start with that press release because as I mentioned, if someone replies to that, that's great. So, you know, why not? Let's, you know, see what comes of that. But then we do, most of the times we don't get, so there's a few people that always reply to our, our announcements and, and we can sort of count on to read our press releases. But most of it is kind of what I call by hand, which is, as you're saying, following up, providing the link to them, mentioning that, you know, they like something comparable, they might like this or, or, you know, just, you know, put Putting it as easy as possible right in front of them. But we do, you know, kind of do the spray and pray just because we want to cover as many bases as we can. And if something good comes out of that, then we certainly wouldn't have wanted to assume that nobody at the Onion AV Club would care. So we just skipped over them. So it's like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to take the time to, you know, put together a, a specific email just for this writer, but they received the, 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 the blast and they could opt in if they wanted to. What are you trying to get people to do when they look at the press or when they... I mean, I understand a lot of it is going to be informed by your client. But I mean, in distribution, I'm shocked the pre-sales are still important. But it's like... And transactional, as we know, is really not a meaningful part of the pie for independent filmmakers. But is that still the target? Is it still rentals and purchases? Or is it just trailer views? Or what do you think is like, what makes you excited in terms of conversion? Yeah, we usually when we come on board, the trailer aspect is either we'll, we'll do some placements for the trailer. But in terms of like a big trailer preview push, we don't recommend it just because people have such a limited budget that we're like, let's push them towards rentals. And we don't even really push people towards pre-sales anymore since being on like wow. the noteworthy doesn't seem to have as much payoff as it used to. Mm. So now we we most times save people. We do a little bit of promoted posts in the beginning to kind of like expand the audience. And, and especially if a filmmaker doesn't already have a, a Facebook page or any kind of social media channels, we will do something to lead up to it. So they've built up that following. So that's definitely important. But we these days have been mostly pushing people towards the rentals. A couple of reasons for that. One is that the platforms and the aggregators have gotten a lot better at real-time results. And that used to be something that a lot of times we would do a full campaign for, for clients and we'd have no idea how it was going. Wait, like six weeks later, you'd have the data? Exactly. Yeah. And so it was just so hard to be reactive in that amount of time. And there's, you know, we do have clients where we'll be on board for a year and we have time to react there. But a lot of people can't afford that level to be, you know, running ads for that amount of time. So now we can be a lot more reactive and we can see right away if there's a spike over the weekends is, you know, we do like to wait and not make immediate reactions just because it's, you know, you need to have some kind of trend and data to make a decision. But still, we can have a little bit more of a sense of what's working and what's not working. So to push people towards the rentals and use that, whereas I could see the trailer would be something because you could immediately see the views on the trailer. And so that would be a way to have tested whether your content was working. But now just with so many people we work with, they have a, a limited budget. And so that's what we push them towards in terms of... And then there's also, you know, which platform you want to push them towards in terms of like, should you push them to the AVOD or to the the TVOD? So that's something that we we also work through with each client as to like, what's what is the payout for them. If it's a short film, we'll push them probably to YouTube because you can see the views there. So it really pays off to have them mostly there. There's other, you know, genre films might make more sense to push towards like where someone can see them for free. It's like risk free, you know, if, especially if like there's no no name actors or something like that, then, you know, push them someplace where it's a low risk for them to tune in and decide this this movie is great. So yeah, it really, it, it really depends. But that's, that becomes more of the decision for us is, you know, how or if you want to push them to a spot flash page where then the audience can decide which where to go from there. Yeah. This is a very specific question, but when, when you've seen success in trailers, right? Like like you get 100,000 views on a trailer or whatever, 50,000 views, something like that. 
Do you ever, like, how often do you see or can you track that translating into purchases or rentals? Or is it more like, oh, it's out there and that's just good or, or and it, it just stops at that? Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of times the trailers that do that well are genre films, at least in our, our sphere, like the ones that are really getting that much. And so that does speak highly for that people will eventually watch the film. But, you know, stuff on digital has a long tail that, you know, a lot of these campaigns, the entertainment world is built on the release date. People get super excited about the release date. And, you know, a lot of the media won't cover it or people won't run their reviews, you know, if it's not somehow tied to, you know, this magical date where it's become released. And so we'll build a lot of our campaign pushes around that. But, you know, if films are available online and and it could be a, a year or two years as, as things build from there. And a lot of times these trailers have sat online for that amount of time. And so, of course, they've racked up that many views. You know, maybe it's been six months or a year. And so it's a little bit different to say, like, how come I didn't get those 100,000 views on my film since I've gotten that many with my trailer because your trailer's been sitting there and it's shorter. Maybe that was playing before something else on YouTube. You know, it's just, it's, it, they're, they're different things to be able to compare them in that way. But usually, you know, if we see that someone come to us and they're like releasing my film and we can see the amount of social media followers they have, the amount of trailer views that they have, we definitely internally get a sense of what the expectations could be for this project. And so, and vice versa, that if they're, they have no social media following and we're starting from scratch with that it's just you know digging out of a large a, a deeper hole and and so we try to just be clear about that yeah can i ask one follow-up really quick like if you do see success on a trailer like it gets like you know whatever a hundred thousand hits or something <clears throat> what can the filmmaker or the pr team do once the hits have already happened like is there a way to like you know capitalize on that kind of viewership or is it kind of like oh once it's got the hundred thousand it's sort of like oh that's done and there's not really a way to utilize that for like you know um you know getting sales or value on that yeah from a like a publicity perspective i would use that as like an angle to be like this film is not a joke you know what i mean like this film right. is serious has a hundred thousand views of the trailer like you know yeah you've never heard of this actor but like the public cares and you should too so right. that to me is helpful from that angle i meet so many filmmakers who will say i don't want I don't even want to touch social media. I don't want to go on Twitter. I'm already exhausted. Now I have to start talking about myself. No, thank you. How do you respond to that that kind of perspective, which, you know, is is fair and and fine. I'd just be curious how you react to it. It's completely fair. It's totally valid. And to a certain extent, we're fine with that is because we love it. So as long as they want us to, as long as they're okay with us doing it, if they're not saying we don't think it's important, we want to spend our money elsewhere. And then that can be challenging because, you know, you're like, okay, you know, this is a huge tool. You should probably use it to your advantage. But like, okay, that's not how you want to, you're not taking our advice on that. And that can be challenging. But if they say, I'm not into this, but I'm glad that you are, we're like, that's great. We've got it from here. <laughs> so that said, it is a super important tool that the idea that will only be on board for a certain period of time, but then they're going to go on to make future movies. So if we get their Twitter going and, you know, get a following and, and get people excited about their work, it doesn't make sense for them to just leave it there for another two years until they have another film going. So we try to convey that. We do have lots of advice for folks for how to make it manageable. You know, some of these things would be like spending one hour on a Monday morning and like scheduling posts or, or if you don't want to actually schedule them, which always makes me nervous to schedule a post because who knows in this world what's going to happen and then your post is going to pop up two hours. Hours after that. But yeah, so, you know, at least, you know, having an, a spreadsheet where you've come up with what you're going to post about and you just do it for an hour and then each day go in and, and schedule that day's post or something like that. There's lots of tools that help. You know, we have suggestions for how to repurpose content. So if we have done a campaign for someone, they can even pull our old posts and just repost that on a different channel or something like that. So we try to make it something that people see the value in or we'll just realistic about it and will if they want to do it in their production company's name and not their name that could be something that's a little bit more accessible and then they can always it is it is funny whenever i hear people say we'll just get an in you go with an intern because this is like the channel that's directly interfacing with your fans <laughs> so it's kind of funny to be like i'll just get someone who's only passing through and doesn't know that much about my style to handle this <laughs> but it, it is something that you know if if they aren't 
fully committed to it. But I do, you know, I do want to emphasize that like the people who are really on on social media, Liz, you're someone who I think does a really good job of like, you sort of walk the line of letting people into your inner thoughts without oversharing. I, I don't know, you know, maybe there's a lot more going on in your life and maybe there's not. But I imagine you have a, a deep inner working that you're not sharing on Twitter. But you'll say like a casting suggestion. Or you, you can't remember this guy's name. Can someone help me? You're looking for a great location. Does anyone have any ideas? And these are things that bring people in and actually can be useful and you know we're not expecting people to have a hot take on the little mermaid you know we're just saying like in fact we would suggest that you not have a hot take on the little mermaid <laughs> just sharing about your own process and if you don't feel like sharing don't but you know you seeing the value in that what that can come out of it but also you know it's like if people are coming to us saying like i'm having a hard time breaking out and building my audience but i hate social media it, you know you're sort of like well maybe that's where you're having a hard time breaking out and and again it's like you know i still i feel like i'm not gen z i feel like i'm sounding like you know gen z that i'm just like well if you're not on social media you know i can't help you because life absolutely exists as on social media but you know if those those are the challenges that you're coming up against as a filmmaker that could be something to consider or, you know, bringing on someone like us who enjoys this process and wants to help you connect with people. I have a slew of questions and I'm, I'm wondering like which ones are too granular and which ones aren't, but let me, let me see I'm just going to go for it. So I've got multiple pages, you know, I've got my own on, on Facebook. We're talking Facebook right now. So I've got my own account, like for me, and then I have my, my alternate film account and I have other accounts, but let's just talk about those two for now. So you know, my movie just came out a few, few days ago, by the way. So I have a new feature film that I wrote and directed. And, you know, I have a PR team with my distributor that I've been working with. And then I've been also doing a lot of my own work myself. So I'm asking very specific questions about like what my experience has been You're like, like so hypothetically, far. let's say someone made a film directed by a male that <laughs> Yeah. Like my movie trailer has over a hundred thousand hits on YouTube. So that's why I've been asking questions about that because I'm yeah, wondering, wondering what I could do to I use that in my advantage. But here, here's a question. So should I be posting like to my film page and then reposting as myself for everything? Or does it make more sense to just post as myself if I get a new review in that's, that's really good and I want to share like what's like the best way to utilize my channels to reach the most people? Yeah, so this has evolved for me over time. And if you are, can your Facebook page, is it public or can people follow you there? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, like, I don't do anything that's in, like, a walled garden that, you know, no right. one else can see because that's not the point there. I think everything's public and open for both yeah. pages. And the film page is just for this film. It's not the production company. Right. It's just for the film. I yeah. do have a production company page, but I don't use it because I found that it's, I don't know, I don't like it. I'd rather just use it for each individual movie, have its own page. But I don't yeah. know if that's smart or not. So, that, so that, I mean, one thing is, like, just over the years, we're just seeing people collect these pages and then they collect dust, you know? So you do the campaign and then they sit there. And then like two years later, it's like, oh, hey, friends, come over and follow us over here now. But that said, we run ads and we need to be able to run ads from some kind of business page, you know? So, and, and it, you know, we want to be able to run it from a page that looks legit and someone's been maintaining. And, and even the production page, in, in my opinion, can be sort of not a great choice because it looks like it's coming. You know, people don't always, they see your name listed as the director, but they don't know that you're the name of your production company. So I don't love doing it from the production company, but it is, it can be a nice solution for people that don't want their name all over everything, but want to take their audience with them in future your projects. So we actually did a whole Sundance Sundance presentation, which might still be live for folks who want to go deep dive into their online, their how to talk about their projects online as an artist. So it's not it wasn't necessarily just about promotions and, you know, best best practices for targeting ads and stuff. It was like, how can you talk about your your work as an artist? Things that I like that so this is my personal opinion would be using that page to do kind of your straightforward stuff. You're like, you know, talk about all the releases, you know, all the info about that. But if you then share that to your your personal page with a personal message and you say you know i'm so excited about this this is why this matters to me you maybe tag you know your cinematographer you tag you know whoever else that you want to that's that's part of it so the the page would be like here's this great review pull quotes super excited and then you share it and you're like holy smokes a rave review from the onion av club we're just gonna go hard with the onion av club <laughs> You know, I'm so excited about this. This makes me so happy. 
but I feel like over time, getting more people excited about following you on your page, if that's something that you're not necessarily just using to share photos of your kids, like you have to be comfortable with knowing that that's where people will be looking right. for stuff that would work. But I do, I think people these days are more interested in like the person and your take on it, you know, how it makes you feel and that personal push to be like, this is why it matters to watch it now. This is why. And they even like lifting the curtain a little bit to be like, you know, you guys, please watch it. If I know if you're thinking of doing it, do it this weekend because this is why it matters. Or, you know, watch it here. I know it's for free on Tubi or Hoopla or whatever, but like if you have the money, rent it wherever, you know what I mean? Like just something like that. Explain how the process works because nobody knows people are interested in that. So that's my take as of today. And I know it's not the best solution because it's still posting in two places, but it's subtly different, you know, the the different content that you would put there. And I'm not someone who personally likes seeing the same post come through. If I follow you on Instagram and then I follow your production company on Twitter, I don't necessarily like seeing the same post in three places. And so, and especially right. now that Facebook and Instagram are so tightly linked, you know, a lot of that stuff gets shared between the two and you'll see a lot of redundancy. So if you've made that personal edge to the one that's on your pages, I think that that's super helpful. Yeah. What I've been doing just to share my process. So like I'll do the alternate Facebook page and then I'll write it in my own voice on the alternate page, then I'll write a slightly different message in my own voice on my own page, sharing the post from the alternate page. And then for Instagram, I don't reshare the same things. I share different things on Instagram. And then that's linked to my personal Facebook page. So then it'll go from Instagram to Facebook. So it'll kind of hit both, but it's all different content on the separate ones. And then I'll just tweet about things randomly and then reshare and and retweet on my own personal Twitter. And then I'll tag my film Twitter too. So I think that's great. Like, I'm sure, you know, that's lazy. Here. Yeah, I, that sounds great to me. But and you have this like complex network. I can see you with the clear, the clear board writing in the marker. Right. But I'm sure Brad and Amy are listening, being like, "No, if you share a post, it's wrong. Don't have much reach. If you share, then if you have an organic post, and that's probably true. I do. You know, there's things like TikTok. If you edit it outside the app, supposedly they know, and you don't get nearly as much reach as if you edit it using the TikTok. So yeah, there's probably a lot of that stuff built in to Facebook and Instagram too. So if anyone's looking for really all that secret sauce, they should give us a call and set up a time to talk with Brad or Amy. But I'll say from my perspective, that I think you're you're onto something, even though it's very complex. <laughs> and in six months, it could totally change when they when they change what what the algorithm promotes or, or just how these pages talk to each other. Right, right. So we are often talking to filmmakers about how making movies is difficult, right? How they're they're tired, they're they're overwhelmed. But you, you know, just from your bio at the beginning of this conversation, you you talk about how you want to empower filmmakers and celebrate them and shine a light on them. I'd be curious, when do those joyful moments happen for you? When I, when is your job most rewarding? Yeah, the other side of this question that I get fairly frequently is like, what happens when someone comes to you with a terrible film and like you you don't? So luckily, other than challenging films like you mentioned that don't have name actors or, or didn't get into major festivals, we we hardly ever get films that are just like truly objectionable, you know? So there's ones that that are just like full of challenges you know, as as we've gone over, there's just a multitude of, you know, there's so many movies made and so few that, that people are talking about. So other than those normal challenges, usually I'm excited because they're excited. And, you know, it's like they've made something that they, they want to get out there. And so it's just for me, like managing expectations about what this film can do. And so sometimes we'll say like, okay, we understand that this is like, we're getting your name out there. Not much could come of this campaign, but like you have to start somewhere where we're building this foundation so people can be like, I think I I've heard of this person before or you know or I'll you know I'll, I'll try to pitch someone with it, it's not going after reviews where I'm pitching them as an expert in their field or you know their their film is about this aspect and maybe they would want to do a feature story someday and they should remember that they're here and so it could be yeah, months that, until something pays off so those are the things that I just try to to and and how you know I'm, I am able to find joy is just you know because I'm just people are booked so hard on these projects and we're there with them in the final lap you know they've just gone around the the marathon they're going and going and like sometimes they're just they're very very close to done (laughs) and so we get to like cheerlead them into you know one of these really hard stages which is like you know it should be so fun bringing it to your audience so yeah so for me of course you know like 
the joy comes when, you know, I hear the ding in my inbox and it's Variety being like, we would love to run this, send a link, you know, and I'm just like, yes, this is so great. A lot of the stuff is these days, is the engagement is we're not even necessarily looking so much as likes and, and it's it's really the comments and the shares. And so if you post something and you see it has like, you know, 46 shares, it's just like, oh, people are excited about this. Like, this is this is cool. And in that also, you know, you just get really excited because you're like, this is working. People are excited to see this person's movie. They're they're feeling good. And we have there's a woman working with now just doing like helping her in the early festival stages. And like, you know, she just emailed this morning because she got the venue for where her film's going to be playing at the festival, you know, and she's just like so excited. The venue, guys, you know, and we're like, we're excited too. You're, that's a great venue, you know, like, you know, like getting to go through that with with filmmakers and, you know, over and over again in the part, hopefully that should be fun for them where like the film actually gets out there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really curious about reviews and like how important you think reviews are, like which review should you share? Which review should you not share? The, the other question is like, once the movie's out and like, it's already got the initial reviews, like are more reviews later down the line helpful? Or is it kind of like, oh, the movie's got out, like you, you had your chance for reviews, you're done with reviews. So just kind of curious to hear like what your thoughts are on all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, reviews still are important, both for, as we talked earlier about kind of leveraging yourself. So if, even if you only get one review, putting that quote, on, if it's a good review, putting it on your filmmaker webpage and in the future saying like hailed as an exciting new voice. And, you know, so that it's, it's useful for like prestige. And we talked about like that appearance of success, having that one review will not convert people to watch your movie unless it's the New York times. If you get reviewed by a film blog, or a film blogger. That's great that they cared about your movie, that they are excited about it. They probably have great taste. And so if they liked it, you should feel good about that. But a lot of like, you know, indie film bloggers, you know, you're not, you're just going to see a lot of traffic come from that. And it's really hard if you're in an independent film and, you know, you didn't get a wide release. It's really hard to get a, a review from like a major paper. So I get all examples all the time where people will, you know, send me this example of, of like a seemingly small film that got reviewed at, at the New York Times the Washington Post or something and I'll dig a little deeper and I'm like oh this film is not as small as you think mm -hmm. you know and I have a running joke that like people think A24 is independent film uh... so yeah you know like a lot of our filmmakers are, are they know that an A24 release is not comparable to theirs but still like people will say like oh I saw this like this is accessible and I'm like maybe you know it's like it's hard to know what how this this came about but if you can get a critical review in a major paper that's awesome just think go into it knowing that there's reasons to do it other than necessarily like now expecting you that you can just kick back and like watch the views pour in. So you still need to leverage that. You still need to work on it. The other thing, of course, is it, and this is possible, is that you can get on the tomato meter with, I think you need 10 reviews to, to get a rating on the Rotten Tomato meter. I got seven and I got a rating, so I don't know. Oh, that, good. Okay, good. So just seven. What? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they're, the, if they're changing it, but yeah. So we'll say somewhere between five and 10 then for now. And so, of course, you know, if that one film blogger is on Rotten Tomatoes, you'll appear on Rotten Tomatoes if they submit it with that one review. But in terms of getting a rating of like a, a ripe tomato or a rotten tomato, you do need a certain amount. But that can be really helpful to get, you know, so if you and, and there's a lot of accessible film critics who are, you know, not writing for major magazines that are on the tomato meter, you know, so like look up comparables, reach out to those folks, you know, see if they'd be interested in reviewing it because, you know, you know, there's I, like Rotten Tomatoes is great. It's like as long as you are regularly putting out reviews, you know, they consider a lot of people to be, you know, they're certified critics. Like it doesn't necessarily need to be paid people that have day jobs doing this. Yeah. So that's something that's very accessible. It can work against you having a, a ripe tomato is awesome. Having a rotten tomato is kind of forever and like that can be a bummer. So if there's some concern that you may not review well, you could start slow and see how they come in. And again, these a lot of these independent critics, they are operating on schedules too. And like they are beholden to some of the studios, you know, even if they're independent, like they need to get these in on time for the studios. So yours will fall by the, way, fall by the wayside because you know, they're not going to be, you're not penalizing anybody if they don't review your movie before the release date. But that said, they can always re review it later. They don't have editors that are telling them necessarily, some do, but if they're running their own film blog, could six months from now decide to finally get that review up? Right. You know, should, you should absolutely take it. Like, that's, you know, that's great. And if it pushes you up on the tomato meter, that's great. But most people will do it around the time the film is released. And so with right. 
unless that they really liked your movie and just didn't get a time you, maybe you released in the middle of Sundance and they were super swamped and that was just bad timing so yeah some can trickle in late there's no rule that says it has to be done by a certain date it's just that's usually how it's done I would right. never send a bunch of pitches a year after a film came out I just know people would be like why would I re- wait a second let me get this straight it came out a year ago and I'd be like yeah I don't know why it matters but it does <laughs> but, but pitching a movie like the week it came out like it came out three days ago four days ago like that's still relevant right like it doesn't matter that you missed the release date it's i mean it depends if they have editors and and this is you know like they need to have it in you know like a vulture or vanity fair they'll do like monthly roundups of like things that are coming and so if yours came out september 16th and you sent it september 20th and it's too late to be in their september roundup you know they they probably won't include it to say you know in that but again there's no rules if they're really excited about it you know they in their editor says fine they could they but usually those they do those things and they mm-hmm. say the date and it's you know they won't it won't make sense right. to run it with the date so i would say giving people enough time to watch it safely before your your release date it, as of now it's still kind of this old-fashioned system as if they're going into a, a video, <laughs> video store on a tuesday and there it is right. you know well, 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 last follow-up question on this don't post bad reviews right like if you get like a, a review that has like some nice things but it's ultimately a, a negative review you don't want to share that with your community, right? You keep that. You can pull the quote as a as a like a graphic and then not link to it. So there's definitely. I mean, if you get a review in a high profile paper and it's mixed, you know, I would say it's like it's more impressive that you're like, here's our impress our review that's associated <laughs> with Variety or something impressive, and then just not cl- link to the whole review. When some films get panned, Brad is my co-founder. He definitely is more on the embrace it. There's no such thing as bad press, but this is like. Mm truly bad like it's like you could like <laughs> run with it like you know like let's show them they think my horror movie is schlock or something like that and like that mm. so in a certain circles that's a vote of confidence <laughs> so mm. i would say that if it's truly bad you could think about owning it in in a certain way but there's it's a special film that can own truly bad reviews but the mixed ones yeah i would say pull the good stuff as a as a graphic and and not mm. link to it but it's probably better to use something of that than to to not have any reviews just because people will be really impressed that you know they like, okay hey, i've heard of this like this is a real film i keep getting served this ad for this indie film and it says la times quote unquote inventive quote quote and it's like <laughs> Like, you know, there's more to that story that they're not (laughs) saying. I can see that stuff from a mile away, but not everybody can. Right. And then the other side of that, too, is I'll see like one of the best films I ever saw, you know, Alric and Liz's movie blog, you know, right? one of the best movies I've ever seen. And I'm really small. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like John Smith or something. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. And it's right up there with the laurels, you know, that, you know, these days you can have your your poster covered in laurels. You look closely and you're like, oh, this is like you know the the north seattle women <laughs> east film los festival. angeles international film festival is the yeah, right example exactly. i always say which might have great taste what do i know you no, know that's but- the one that nathan nathan fielder created in his show sorry oh, okay. i'm such a deep cut nerd for nathan fielder but sorry <laughs> But please go on. No, my example might have great taste. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, people in the industry can spot that stuff from a mile away, but a lot of people can't. And so that's just you know, your call for like how much you're willing to go for it and how much you just can't stomach. <laughs> and I know we have to wrap up, but I have one last question, which is can you share, it doesn't have to be the rates of Smart House Creative, but how much do you encourage filmmakers have to spend for this phase of, of their release? Sure. We have some packages actually on our website. So we're we try to be as transparent as possible about our rates and what where it all goes to. So people can check out certain packages on our website. There used to be this old rule that was like 10% of your budget. And I never understood that because to a certain extent for me, you know, if your film has, you know, no stars and, and hasn't done super well, that's actually more work for me because I have to explain to everybody why they should watch this movie and what makes it really cool. If I'm if getting a film that's, you know, coming out of Sundance or is, you know, about to play in th- in theaters, certain critics have to review it because it's just like it, they can't deny it. This movie is playing 
in a hundred cinemas across the country, like their editors are going to make them review it. So I'm like, oh, well, that I, that, that would be a case where it's like I send the press release and I get, you know, 30 replies right there because it's like they can't ignore this the size of this film or, you know, if it has a star in it that they're excited about. So to me, I'm like these big ones with the giant budgets are actually less of a, they you know, less of a challenge to me because I'm not trying to think of all these alternative ways. I'm not yeah. writing articles. I'm not writing op-eds, you know, which is what I'm doing with the films that are totally worthy but don't have that star power to them. And so that's, so it's, it's, it's tough for, for me to make that call right away. So, but I mean, for us, like we're usually operating in like the 10 to 15,000 range and that's including like your digital marketing. And it's just a matter of how long and every film would be different in terms of how long we suggest to keep running ads for. But now with the real time results, you, you know, we just say like, if you're bringing in more than you're spending, then you should keep running them until that's not the case anymore. So, you know, digital marketing is a little bit less of a mystery now that you can see how well it's doing. But some films just, it doesn't make sense to keep running the campaign after like you do the big push and you get over that hurdle and, and you know, you make the initial splash or you don't. And then it's just like, okay, after a few months, like it, it's like you have to move on to your next project. That's just how it goes. So yeah, but that's usually the ballpark of like what's what we'd be in, a, in like a normal size campaign that would include some level of media outreach. And then of course, there's, there's different levels for the social media, whether you want us to create all the content. And the nice thing about working with filmmakers is that most times it's super easy to have them cut trailers or clips and and pull scenes for us and so other clients that's like a you know they don't know how to do that and so you know creating that kind of content for them but when you're working with creative people a lot of times they are excited they're the ones who created the graphics so it's no problem for them to adapt them with the the new style that you need so that actually comes pretty easy and is not a big expense for us but uh, you know other people running social media that's the main expense is like creating the content like that's Mm. where the money goes but films the you know you have the film to pull from so but yeah so uh, again with that like everything's different and not every film needs to spend nearly that much like you we have done campaigns for a thousand dollars we've done campaigns for five thousand dollars it's just like you know a lot of it is like what do we think how much like we want to be honest and be like what we think we can get for you and so sometimes it's just like you know what Let, let's send this to genre publications and and see how it goes but it just doesn't make sense to you know pitch this out to to all the trades or, or whoever um and so you know you can just be really targeted and, and go right for your audience and and, and that's all you need. Amazing. One last quick question. If you have like a couple hundred dollars to spend on Facebook ads, do you think that's like a worthwhile expense? And, yeah. you know, if so, is it good to spend like $200 across like five days or is it better to s- split that $200 across like a month? That is probably too specific question, but I would say <laughs> $200 is, a, is you can actually get a lot of traction. You might want to consult with a digital marketing person to spend it right though. So to make sure that like you're reaching new audiences, you're not just hitting your existing audience again and again with the same ad. So I could I would say that $200, you can totally get something for it. But I would be smart about it and learn a few things before you do it. Because we've definitely gotten clients who are like, you know, we've already tried Facebook ads. And then we look and we're like, well, this is maybe why that's not working. <laughs> yeah, I spent 120 bucks, got like 91 clicks on my pre order link. So I felt pretty good. I know. So that's what I was like. I was like, head. yeah, $200. Absolutely. If you had $200, be some, and, and yeah, make the call to action something that makes sense. So yeah, just do it smart. And like, but absolutely. Absolutely. You know, $200 could, you could get some traction there. Nice. I think we'll just ask this final question, which is, is marketing for movies hard? We usually like to ask, is making movies hard? So feel free to answer either one. But do you find making movies or marketing for making movies hard? It is. It is hard, but you work with some nice people. And the nice thing is that we're not marketing, you know, a product or a a corporation or, you know, we have to do some of the same tactics, but like we're selling people an experience, an escape, a piece of art. So it is hard, but we can feel really good about it. Well, please, what's your call to action? How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, they can visit our website, smarthousecreative.com, or they can feel free to find us on social media. All of our channels are Team Smart House. People are welcome to email me as well. It's pretty straightforward. Ryan, R-Y-A-N at smarthousecreative.com. Liz, what do you remember about our talk with Ryan? 
just being feeling very in tune with her. You know, there are like when you work in artist support, you work at places like Sundance or AFS or when Tribeca Film Institute existed or the Gotham. You kind of all kind of talk the same talk in terms of distribution. And you hear these kind of things from me all the time, like build your own audience and be an entrepreneur. Like, you know, there's this dialogue that we all kind of spout out. And it was just really nice to hear it and agree with everything that she says and just feel very in tune with her. So I, I just remember nodding a lot, just like a lot of like whiplash nodding, listening to <laughs> Ryan Davis and glad that Smart House Creative exists. What do you remember? Well, we had Smart House Creative on million trillion years ago before Liz's time. And I was trying to remember who it was. And it, it, it turned out it was Brad and Amy who are like other team members, part of Smart House Creative, not, not Ryan herself. And so it was really fun to have Ryan on, like to kind of get a completely different perspective of their company and how they work, you know, and kind of get a little bit of, uh, you know, the, the Brad and Amy philosophy, like kind of filtered through Ryan, you know. But I just remember, like thinking at the time, like I had all these questions and I was like, okay, well, you know, that, that was good. And then now coming back, like whatever, four or five years later and being like, oh, I have so many more questions. And like, I've got, I've like knew what to ask more than I did mm. many, many years ago. So I felt like I got like a, a lot out of this conversation and it was really interesting to, to hear a little bit about some of the details about placing Facebook ads, like how they approach a project in general, like what they look for from a filmmaker when they, when they start and like, you know, having, you know, just worked with a PR firm through a production company, it's such an interesting experience that like when you work in that way versus if you hire the production, the PR firm yourself, like you're getting such a more hands-on sort of close experience because you know exactly what you're hiring them for. But like when, when I worked with my PR firm, I didn't know how many hours they had. I didn't know any of the details of like what they're, what they're hiring, being hired to do. I just knew that they were there to support the film, you know, and I worked and it worked great. I was, it was a great experience, but I just feel like getting a little, that talk with Ryan, I was able, able to peel back the curtain a little bit and get a little bit more detail on how it all works. Okay. Yeah, very, very cool conversation. This is reminding me a little bit of a chat I had with another filmmaker a few months ago. They were releasing their first feature and I recommended a publicist that I had used on my feature and they negotiated a much, much lower rate with the publicist. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And and he was like, well, yeah, you know, well, she she's going to do the same thing no matter what. It's just a plug and play. So, you know, we huh. offered her a little less. And I started to think about it. I started to think about the coverage they got, which was not, not stellar. Right. Mm, and I was thinking mm. about we think of publicists and PR firms as like, oh, they just kind of like are a template and they just spout out, you know, they just write emails and then they receive information <laughs> and then they, you know, book interviews. And it really isn't that. And for any vendor that you work with, if you pay them less than their rate, they're going to deprioritize you. And I, I, I don't know, is this turning into a soapbox thing? Maybe. No, I think it's, I think it's a good point. Yeah. Because there is a lot of like, you know, hitting the ground sort of like, it's not actually like hitting the pavement, but it's like hitting the digital pavement, you know? Yeah. Like, cause the team that I worked with on the alternate, they, they like take the trailer and then like go out and search for YouTube channels that would want to post the trailer. And they do like a lot of like individual outreach, you know, for the movie to like these different specific vendors. And then they, right. they target different specific blogs and websites and, you know, even critics to like try to review the movie. And they have like a stable of people they work with, obviously, but then they, they also go outside of that, you know, that the confines of who they already know. It really like kind of comes down to your, your, your movie. Like, is your movie interesting enough to get people to want to cover it, you know? But also respect, like mutual respect. Like if you're paying someone their full fee, yeah. they're going to feel like there's a level of mutual respect there where they <laughs> honor your time and you honor theirs, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, like, yeah. if, if you don't pay them their full fee, do you think you're going to get the same amount of emails sent yeah, out that, as well, the that's people what that who filmmaker, didn't? <laughs> yeah, that filmmaker implied. He was just like, well, you know, they're going to go out the same people regardless. And it's like, they're not. There they're really is not. a care and a love that, y that you as a filmmaker need to enact. You need to empower in the collaborators you work with. You can't just assume everyone's yeah. going to do their best work for you. And I'm just thinking about a company like Smart House Creative. I'm sure they do wonderful work for every filmmaker that chooses to hire them, that they choose to work with. But it just reminds me of like when people talk with me about sales or they talk with my friends about key art or they talk with publicists, there's this presumption that vendors kind of work in an automated, automated way, but it's not. And what Ryan really proved was there's like a lot of thought and heart and creativity that go into all aspects of the release of a film. And I loved how 
sensitive she was to the artist's plight and Mm -hmm. how by the time we get there, we have a lot of our hopes and dreams pinned on on the film's reception. And it seems like films are in good hands when they go over to Smart House. So I just was happy about that and just cranky about my friend who lowballed that (laughs) publicist. That's all. Well, you saw how excited Ryan got about marketing. Like, yeah. you know, you, she she lit up when she was like talking about previous campaigns and like, you could do this, you could do that. Like, she like had this like joy. But imagine if you're like limiting like a person and you're like devaluing them, like, are they going to bring that joy to your project? No, no, they'll probably go to the other project that they're they're more excited about, you know? So, I don't know. Yeah, respect. I think that's a good good point. You got to respect your collaborators, you know? Because you get, you get what you put out, you know? Like, if you put out a certain amount of energy towards them, they're going to give you that same energy back, you know? So, but it's time. Oh, it's time. And I am very excited to, to ask you this question. It's Liz's turn on the game to uh, basically answer a question. It's, it's basically what it is. If you haven't heard this before, our producer, Eric Toms, or listeners like you come up with ideas or concepts like scenarios for indie filmmakers of like, this problem happens, this thing happens. What do you do in this situation? How do you solve this problem? And we've been playing it for like, you know, a couple months now, I think. And we love it. It's so much fun. So yeah, I got the question for Liz. Liz has not heard this question before. She does nothing about it. I haven't even, I read it once. I did not read it in detail, but I'm really excited to ask it right now. So here it goes. You've wrapped production on your sci-fi feature when out of the blue, you're contacted by a new investor is going to give you a substantial amount of money going into the into post-production. It's not enough to go back and reshoot with a huge celebrity, but it's a sizable amount of money. Where do you spend this newfound capital? This is multiple choice. A, get a very high-end composer license or license a very popular song. B, really ramp up your special effects and hire a company to create and shoot miniatures rather than the CGI you planned on. C, pour the money into an additional PR marketing firm. And then D, other. What do you do, director? What do you do? I mean, it is my dream to have a substantial marketing and distribution fund. It is like my dream in life to really be able to hire all... It's like such a great question to come off of our last conversation because I really want to hire people at their full rates to do their best job with a film that I have Mm -hmm. and not feel like I'm constantly like having to scramble or take on work myself because I can't afford that vendor. So, I mean, I will say with the caveat that I'm happy with the CGI and that it's serviceable because the idea of shooting with miniatures sounds really exciting, I would definitely go over to PR and marketing and spend all the money on the film's release, on a digital ad campaign, on the best trailer I can have, on a wonderful publicist, maybe, you know, uh, and get all these assets together to pitch to to sales agencies that are above my pay grade. And normally, like I'm a sales rep, but if I can get to a top tier sales agency, I would. I mean, that is all like super, super exciting. I just wanted to note about the composer situation. I hate when really, really popular songs are licensed in movies. Like, I just think it's distracting. It's a waste. (sighs) It's a co-opting of something of other people's memories of that song and turning it into forcing and pigeonholing it for your film. I'd much more prefer lesser known songs and original music. So that was an easy no. But Ulrich, what were you thinking? I also hate that. I was watching yeah. Finch on Apple TV, the oh, yeah. Tom Hanks robot movie. And like, I think it's uh, American Pie is like played throughout that movie. Yeah. And like, dear God almighty, like, please, for the love of God, like, do we have to have this song in another movie and like, you know, or songs from this era? It's like, let's move on already, man. Like, we don't need this to make this movie or a Credence song. It's like, please, God, don't do that anymore. Well, I will say the exception is something like a Forrest Gump when you're like trying to tap into a time period, right? But yeah. like, to, but American Pie is like, to use that song is just dangerous. In a science fiction, yeah. futuristic, dystopian. Yeah sort of it's like come on now like we just don't need it anyways I'll have the director yell at me someday maybe <laughs> if they listen to this and be like oh no it was it was really important actually so the director of that is directing House of Dragon right now and oh I'm watching that doing a fantastic job I love that show yeah yeah to answer the question what would I do well <laughs> so having made a sci-fi feature and coming out of production and being you know very much in trouble going into post financially I would take that money and just make sure that all my, you know, T's are crossed and I's are dotted, you know, 
like make sure there's plenty of money to pay for like not plenty of money but that we have a budgeted amount of money for the LLC fees and the the tax fees for the the tax the CPA for every year for like four years. So like take that money, put it aside. You know, I would make sure that any debt I might have incurred or, you know, something I put on my credit card was paid off. So like just to get that taken care of and be done with. If anyone else on the team, like producers put put up money on their credit card, just get that taken care of, done with, just so we don't have to worry about it later, you know? And then from there, I would basically look at every department and post and just make sure that like, you know, we didn't shortchange anyone in a bad way going into the production because we we had to and just rectify any of those wrongs, you know? So like if we stole money from <laughs> post sound to pay for something, I would make sure the post sound people get their money back, you know, and that like we're giving them everything they need to do their job correctly. You know, same for visual effects, same for everything. So I would just make sure that everyone is whole throughout post post production and the movie has a really bright financial future ahead of itself. So it's not going to be like me having to pay for the CPA every year out of my own money, you know, and then charging it back to the movie. Like, it's just not get into any of those problems. And then whatever's left over from that, I don't know. It really totally is dependent on the story, dependent on everything. I would love to shoot miniatures, but like, I think given all the money I just spent on all the other things, I probably don't have enough left for, for well, that. Hold on. I, I <laughs> like your answer because it really shows like a thoughtfulness that I think people will appreciate. But I think the question presumes that you hadn't begged and borrowed from other departments. Okay. So you're saying that like you're going to post totally you're great. Full. You're budgeted. You're, you're yeah. budgeted. No problems. Now you just have this extra money. So what okay. would w- then go back? Do you want to do miniatures? Why not? Like to talk about what, what excites you. Well, I mean, I feel like doing miniatures, what, like, let's say it's a sci fi movie that's like got like futuristic cities with like, you know, a, a space taxi landing or whatever. And we were going to do it all in CGI worlds or whatever. Like doing that in, with miniatures, it's just, I mean, I don't, I think it's completely, like, you can't argue that it looks, it looks so much better <laughs> with miniatures. Like there's no, no one could tell me <laughs> that a miniature doesn't have a special look because it certainly does, you know, and I feel like it's a look that's being lost these days because visual effects are so good and getting better and better. But yeah, I would definitely, you know, put that money towards, you know, miniatures for key moments if they exist in the movie, which I'm assuming they would in in this version, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's probably my answer. Imagining, but, but I guess my point is almost every movie, I don't know, maybe your movies are different, but like, I feel like most movies going out of production incurred additional costs they didn't expect. But are you like, in your experience, is that not true? Like, do you feel like you go into a to production, come out of production and you're like, no, the, bu- the, the budget is great. My there producers, no problems. in both my features, my producers overestimated contingencies and we had money, a little bit of extra money going into post than we're expected. Wow. That being said, we may be budgeting way more cheaply than you are for post-production. We may have mm-hmm. already gone into post-production squeezing every cent out of post-production, right? So mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's necessarily bet. like I'm not in any way implying that we did a better job, but I think that the the neuroticism, <laughs> the neurotic qualities of my producers enforced a contingency that saved us both times. Mm. Mm, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe one day, maybe my next movie will be like that. We'll come out of production and then we'll be feeling very good about the budget. <laughs> I, yeah. I certainly hope well, so. Who knows? And I never had enough money, by the way. And the people who worked for me in both films were never paid what they were deserve. You know, right, what they deserve. Right. So, I mean, it's, I would love that. I'd love a job where I paid everyone what they deserve. Who's pay, who gets paid what they deserve? Like, I mean, on Marvel, Marvel. movies, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like indie budgets are so low. It's like, yeah. Like the day rates are like, are like basically half of what like a like a regular commercial day rate is, and and like yeah. to to get to what people deserve, it's like you gotta you gotta have a lot of money. <laughs> You know, yeah. so yeah. anyways, but yeah, this is a great question. You know, obviously, man, it would be great to put money into initial PR and marketing, but it's like, I think for me, the idea of plussing the movie and like really making it like as special as it could be, like, I think that would be too tempting, you know, yeah. if the movie was, was served by miniatures, which I think the question is implying it would be. So, I, and that makes perfect sense. And the fact that, like, my day job is sales and distribution, I'd love to point to my film as a case study and say, this is what you can do if you have real money. 
and you could take an indie, you know, micro budget or lower budget indie and propel it to a stratosphere with this kind of budget. Like I'm, I'm tempted for my, for personal gain to have that information for a case study in the future, right? It's not necessarily. Nice. So it's like, I love that your inclination is to tell the better story with the resources and mine is <laughs> to provide the data to audiences on how, and to filmmakers on how you can make yeah. money on your movies. It really begs a good question though. It's like, what's, what's the, what's more important? Like making the movie like the most special it can be or making sure people see the movie in the first place, right. you know, like, right. I don't know. It's a pretty good argument for people just seeing it. <laughs> a good argument for both. Yeah, true. Before we do our closing, I wanted to shout out a company that I heard about, if that's cool. And this is not, I guess, I wanted to be very clear. This is not a sponsor, but Gil Holland, who's just like a wonderful producer that I connected with recently, wanted emailed me about his company. It's called Sonoblast. And it's a label slash music publishing company. They operate under a pay what you can basis, which I just think is beautiful because a lot of indie films can't really, just like we were talking about, by the time they get to post-production, they don't have money to license music. Music. So this company has like a lot of fantastic music. They encourage you to pay what you can. They even have gratis or free licenses if you're micro budget or completely out of money. They control both the master and the publishing side. So you just are one stop shop. And the songs that they have in their library have been in like The Big Sick or Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, the movie, or Gossip Girl or Stranger Things. And so if anyone's interested in just checking it out again, we're not, they're not a sponsor. We're just saying this is a cool thing that we heard about. Head on over to soundcloud.com slash Sonablast. And that's S-O-N-A-B-L-A-S-T to check out their library. And then just go to sonablast.com to start working with them. Now on to the usual outro. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can hit, you can send it to us at podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. If you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at MMIH Podcast, YouTube at Making Movies is Hard Podcast. Check out jambox.io, who is a sponsor. They are a royalty-free music and SFX company with an emphasis in high-quality cinematic cues, and they offer customized plans. So check them out, jambox.io. We want to thank Ryan Davis for coming on the show. We want to thank our editor, Jeff Rymoot, for doing all the editing, being wonderful. Thanks to our producer, Eric Toms, for equally being wonderful. Thanks to all y'all for listening and talk to you next week. Oh yeah, you just opened the floodgates. I think it might be on the website, but I don't think I really revealed anything there. <laughs> People are going to be thrilled. They're going to be like, I'm going to email her right now. <laughs>